Okay, hello everyone. So we finished the first exam this morning for specialist math. And overall, I will say this one is an evenly spread challenging exam. So let's quickly go through this one together. All right, the first one, we want to solve the differential equation dy dx equals 2y e2x over 1 plus e2x. And we have an initial condition that is y of 0 equals pi. So x equals 0 and y equals pi. Basically, we're using separation of variables. Now I divide both sides by y. So I will have y dy dx equals e to the power of 2x over 1 plus e2x. And if I integrate both sides, I could write 1 over y dy equals e2x, 1 plus e2x dx. And to recognize the left-hand side is quite easy, log e of y with no absolute value because my, because my initial value of y is just pi greater than 0. And my right-hand side will be, let's say, u equals 1 plus e2x. So the u dx is just, oh, hang on a second. I missed a 2 over there. Should be 2e2x. Right, so I think the pattern is just like 1 over u du, which gives me natural log u plus c and right hand side is log e1 plus e2x plus c when x equals 0 y equals pi therefore log e of pi equals log e1 plus e0 plus c and my log e of pi will equal log e 2 plus c. Therefore, my c will be log e pi over 2. And finally, I'm going to put c back. it will be half pi times 1 plus e2x. Because the question does not specify the form of the solution, I could just leave the answer like that, but let's just cancel log e both sides, and we will have y equals half pi 1 plus e2x. All right? When I first saw question two, I was quite astonished by this one. Too easy. Waste of three marks in this 40 marks paper. But let's do it. Absolute value of x minus 4 can be written as plus or minus bracket x minus 4 equals x on to plus 7. And the first case is x minus 4 equals x on to plus 7. So your half x will be 11, and x is just 22. A second case, 4 minus x equals x on to plus 7. And you will have 3x over 2 equals minus 3, because 4 minus 7 is minus 3. Finally, x is just minus 2. An easy three mark question. Now let's look at question three. A machine produces chocolate in the form of a continuous cylinder of radius 0.5 centimeters. So R equals half centimeter. Smaller cylindrical pieces are cut parallel to its end, as shown in the diagram below. Length of the pieces vary with a mean of three and a standard deviation of 0.1 centimeters. The length in this case is just the height of each cylinder. So I would say h 
is a normal distribution from the word vary with mean 3 and standard deviation 1 tenth and the variance should be 1 tenth to the power of 0. Find the expected value of the, a piece of chocolate in centimeter cubed. Expected volume. So EV will be E, the base times high. The base is pi r squared times h. Because I know my radius is a fixed value, like a constant, and a pi is also a constant. So I'm taking out pi r squared times the expected value of h. And a pi times half to the power of 2 times expected value of h, which is 3. And finally, I will have 3 pi over 4 centimeters cubed. Find the variance of the volume of a piece of chocolate in centimeter to the power of 6. Hmm, this time, the exam author is very pedantic on using the right unit. Um, the variance of the volume will just be the variance of pi r squared times h. In this case, my random variable is h here. So I will be treating pi and r squared as a constant. And don't forget var ax plus b. For a, b constants, we will have a squared var of x plus 0. In this case, a will just be pi r squared. So it's pi r squared, everything squared, times variance of h. And we will have pi times half to the power of square and square again. And the variance is 100, if I'm not mistaken. Finally, we will have pi square over 16 times 100, which will be pi square over 1600. And the unit is centimeter to the power of six, a square of centimeter cubed. Find the expected surface area of a piece of chocolate in centimeter square. Surface area. Imagine we have these shapes. If we cut the cylinder along the edges, we will have the 2D version of two bases and one rectangle. So my expected TSA, total surface area, will be expected value of 2 pi r squared, which is representing the sum of two, base, two bases, plus the side, the side area, 2 pi r times h. Remember, this one is h, and this one is our length of the circumference, pi r times 2, or pi d, if you like to write it. And finally, taking out e 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r e of h. Because 2 pi is a constant, r squared is a constant, it will just be 2 pi times half squared plus 2 pi times half times the expected value of h, which is 3, cancels out. And this one will have pi on 2. This term becomes 3 pi. Finally, it will be 7 pi on 2. Or you can write it as 3.5 pi and the unit is centimeter squared. All right. Pretty good question. Brand new, new idea. Let's move on. The position vectors of two particles A and B at a time t seconds after they have started moving. After they have started moving. That means I must have a value of t greater than zero. Are given by this vector and that vector. A is a real constant and T has this domain. 
Find the value of A if the particles collide after they have started moving. So the key is they have started moving. After they have started moving. Let's equate X components. T squared minus 1 equals T cubed minus T. Rearrange it, we have t minus 1, t plus 1, equals t, t squared minus 1, which is t, t minus 1, t plus 1, as a factorized form. Now, instead of canceling both sides by t minus 1, I would transpose everything to one side. So it will be t, t minus 1, t plus 1, minus t minus 1, t plus 1, equals 0. And taking t minus 1 as the common factor, we will have t times t plus 1, minus t plus 1, equals 0. I'm pretty sure in between 0 and 2, t equals 1 is the only feasible value because t plus 1 will give us minus 1 as the time which is outside the range of t. t equals 0, that's the time for starting and I shouldn't have t equals 0. All right, now I need to equate the y components. a plus t on 3 equals cosine inverse t on 2. Subbing in t equals 1, we have a plus 1 on 3 equals cos inverse 1 on 2. So what is cos inverse 1 on 2? I'm thinking cos an angle equals half. So cos what equals a half? Pi on 3. And a plus 1 on 3 equals pi on 3. a will be pi on 3 minus 1 on 3. If you don't mind, I could write it as pi minus 1 on 3, which is also correct. Okay? Question 5. 6 marks. Probably part B is was omitted by many candidates, but it's relatively obvious. Three marks, no space. Anyway, f dash of x. f dash of x will just be, okay, drop the power by 1 to cos x times minus sine x. Cos x after the differentiation becomes minus sine x and plus 1 is gone. So f dash of x will just be minus sine x to cos x plus 1. Hence, find the coordinates of the turning point of the graph in the interval 0 to pi, both exclusive. I would say f dash of x equals 0, so sine x equals 0. From 0 to 2 pi, we only have x equals pi because we can't take x equals 0 or x equals 2 pi. And obviously on the graph is pi 1, so the turning point is pi 1. The second case, 2 cos x plus 1 equals 0. So cos of x equals minus half. And by inspection, I would say x equals 2 pi on 3. Remember, all station to Camberwell. This bit and that bit, both negative. The base angle is pi on 3. So it's pi minus pi on 3 or pi plus pi on 3. And the other x value is 4 pi on 3. Now, instead of summing in x value back into the f of x, I have the value of cos x, so I'm treating cos of x as a whole thing. So my f 
2 pi on 3 will just be minus half squared plus minus half plus 1, which is 1 on 4 minus half plus 1 gives us 3 on 4. Therefore, the turning points have coordinates 2 pi on 3, 3 on 4, or 4 pi on 3, 3 on 4. Now I need to sketch the graph of y equals 1 on f of x. So it's a reciprocal on the axis above. Clearly label the turning points and endpoints of this graph with their coordinates. So now, this one is 0, 3. After taking the reciprocal, 0 is still 0, but 3 becomes 1 on 3. So it should be roughly here. 0, 1 on 3. Again, this one is 2 pi and 3. So x value remains the same, but y becomes the reciprocal. It's 2 pi, 1 third. And this one is pi 1. The reciprocal of 1 is still 1. I notice at x equals half pi, y equals 1. After reciprocal, it should be the same point. Now, with these two, we have 2 pi on 3 and 3 on 4. 4 pi on 3 is 3 on 4. So taking the reciprocals will give us 2 pi on 3, 4 on 3. 4 on 3 is 1.333 recurring. So the actual point should be here and here. Now I'm connecting these points carefully and smoothly. And don't forget to label the turning points. This one will be 2 pi on 3, 4 on 3. And this one is 4 pi on 3, 4 on 3. And I don't need this point here. All right, pretty easy. Find the value of d for which the vectors a is 2 minus 3, 4, b is minus 2, 4, minus 8, and c equals minus 6, 2, d. They are linearly dependent. We have two methods. Method 1, ma plus mb equals c. The linear combination of a and b equals c. So I have 2m minus 2n equals minus 6. Minus 3m plus 4n equals 2. And the last component is k component, so it's 4m minus 8n equals d. Solving these two first. Multiplying the first equation by 2, 4m minus 4n equals minus 12. And the second equation is 3, minus 3m plus 4n equals 2. Adding them together, I have m equals minus 10. With the second one, let's say minus 3 times minus 10 plus 4n equals 2. So 30 plus 4n equals 2. 4n equals minus 28. And a n equals minus 7. Finally, d equals 4 times m, which is 4 times minus 10, minus 8 times minus 7. So it's minus 40 plus 56, which is 16. If you are doing, say, Unimath at the same time, here is another possible approach. But be careful, if you use that approach and made some silly mistakes, 
you may not receive any mark. So let's say the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix, 2 minus 3 and 4, minus 2, 4, minus 8, minus 6, 2, D. I'm considering the first element 2, and I'm using 4 minus 8, 2, D, 4 minus 8, 2d plus the second one minus 3. The determinant of minus 8d minus 2 minus 6 plus the third one 4 and I'm writing down the third determinant which is minus 2 4 minus 6 2. Okay let's carry on the calculation 2 times 4 times d, which is 4d, minus minus 8 times 2, so it's plus 16. Minus 3, bracket, 8 and 6 together, 48, plus 2d. And finally, we have 4, bracket, minus 2 times 2, minus 4, minus minus 6 times 4, plus 24. This will be 8D plus 32 minus 144 minus 6D minus 16 plus 96. Then we will have 8D with minus 6D. This is 2D plus 32 plus 96, this will be 128, minus 144 minus 16 will be minus 160 together. So I have 2d minus 32, which is 2 bracket d minus 16. After a long calculation, we know the condition for linear dependence of vector set A, B, and C is the determinant equals 0. So D is just 60. Okay. Question 7. 5 marks. Show that 3 minus root 3i is 2 root 3 c minus pi on 6. I know it's in the form of R cis theta, where R is the magnitude and theta is the principal argument. So R equals square root of 3 squared plus minus root 3 squared, which is square root 9 plus 3, square root of 12, 2 root 3. Theta equals tangent inverse imaginary part, which is minus root 3 without I over 3. It can be written as minus tangent inverse root 3 over 3, which is minus pi on 6. Therefore, 3 minus root 3i equals 2 root 3 c minus pi on 6. Find 3 minus root 3i. Obviously, we can use the polar form of 3 minus root 3i. So I'm just writing it as 2 root 3 c minus pi on 6 to the power of 3, which is 2 root 3 whole thing to the power of 3 c minus triple the angle minus 3 pi on 6. And the first one should be 8 times 3 root 3 times c minus pi on 2. And it will be 24 root 3, c minus pi on 2. Where is c minus pi on 2? It's below the imaginary axis with length 1, which is minus 1. So this one will just be 24 root 3 times minus i, which gives us, in the form of x plus y i, 0 minus 24 root 3 times i. 
Find the integer values of n for which 3 minus root 3i to the power of n is real. 2 root 3 to the power of n times 6 minus n pi on 6 is a real number. If it's a real number, it must have the principal argument 0 or pi. Let's just generalize minus pi minus m pi on 6 equals 0, yes, plus or minus pi, I guess yes, plus or minus 2 pi, yes, plus or minus 3 pi, I agree with that. Hmm, what should I go next? So n will just be 0 minus or plus 6 minus or plus 12, etc. I know it's an integer multiple, an integer multiple of 6. So I would say n equals 6k, where k is an integer. Find the integer values of n for which this bit equals ai, where a is a real number. It can be negative real number or positive real number. So that means my minus m pi on 6 could equal pi on 2 or minus pi on 2. Actually, if I'm thinking about the periodicity of a, any circular function, like sine or cos, I know the distance from one x-intercept to the other is just half period, so I need to add k pi for that. So minus m pi on 6 equals 2 at the bottom, pi plus 2k pi at the top. Now, amplifying the denominator, I would say it's 3 pi plus 6k pi. So my m value minus n will be 3 plus 6k. So n will be minus 3 minus 6k, where k is any integer. By the way, if you wrote the answer like 3 plus 6k or 3, 2k plus 1, where k is any integer. I think that's an equivalent expression. For example, if you take k equals minus 1 or minus 2, it will generate a positive value of n, vice versa. Question 8. Find the volume of the solid of a revolution formed when the graph of that is rotated about x-axis over the interval 0 to 1. So it's using v equals pi from 0 to 1 y squared dx, which is pi 0 to 1. Square of a square root eliminates the square root, so it's 1 plus 2x over 1 plus x squared dx. Don't forget dx, otherwise you will be penalized. Pi 0 to 1. 1 over x squared plus 1 dx plus pi 0 to 1. 2x pl 1 plus x squared dx. What I'm doing here, I'm separating a big fraction into two smaller fractions. By doing that, I will be recognizing the pattern of the integral. 1 over x squared plus 1 will give us tangent inverse. If you refer to our formula sheet, the official VCAA formula sheet, and the second one, 2x, is just the derivative of 1 plus x squared. So I'm using f dash of x over fx. The antiderivative will be log e absolute value f of x plus c. But I'm calculating a definite integral here, so I don't need to include plus c. Natural log 1 plus x squared. Because for x greater than 0, smaller or equal to 1, x squared plus 1 is positive. I don't need the absolute value. 
Now I have pi times 10 inverse 1 minus 10 inverse 0 plus pi natural log 2 minus natural log 1. So the final answer is pi times pi on 4 minus 0, which is nothing, plus pi times natural log 2. It could be written as pi squared over 4 plus pi log e subscript of 2. And the unit is unit to the power of 3, unit cubed. I've heard a lot of the students today had really big trouble with the mechanics, the equilibrium question. Let's look at it. A light in extensible string is connected at the end of at the end to a horizontal ceiling. A mass of m kilograms hangs in equilibrium from a smooth ring on the string. As shown in the diagram below, the string makes an angle alpha with the ceiling. Express the tension T newtons in the string in terms of mg and alpha. Obviously, we have the gravitational force mg because it's the same rope with, the, with two equal angles, alpha and alpha. These two tensions will be the same, I mean with the same magnitude. Now let's draw an imaginary horizontal line. This one is alpha, this one is alpha, and this one is, I suppose, right angle. And the angle in between these, these bits, these two sides, will be pi minus 2 alpha. So I'm going to use my Lamy's law, t over sine alpha plus pi on 2 equals mg over this is my mg the tail is pointing to this angle so it's mg over a sine pi minus 2 alpha t will be mg times sine pi on 2 plus alpha over sine pi minus 2 alpha and it's mg times if we recall the basic complementary properties from mass method unit 1 and 2 or mass method unit 3 and 4 I would just write it as cos alpha I know sine theta equals sine pi minus theta so this one this 2 alpha is just my theta here it's sine 2 alpha. It could be simplified further because mg times cos alpha will be divided by 2 cos alpha sine alpha and canceling cos alpha from top and the bottom we will have mg over 2 sine alpha. A different light in extensible string is connected at each end to a horizontal ceiling. A mass of m kilograms hangs from a smooth ring on the string. A horizontal force of f newtons is applied to the ring. The tension in the string has a constant magnitude. And the system is in equilibrium. What does that mean? That means I could assume these two tensions have same magnitude, let's say t. And I have the gravitational force, mg. Can we apply sine rule or Lamy's theorem again? No, even though this system is in equilibrium, but we don't have three forces acting on the same object. Now we have one extra force F, so we can't use Lamy's theorem, and instead we must apply force resolutions. 
this bit and that bit. This will be t times cos 2 beta. This is 2 beta. And this bit is t times sine 2 beta. Let's change to another color to decompose this t here. We will also have t, this one is beta, cos beta, and t sine beta. So vertically, we have t sine 2 beta plus t sine beta equals mass times gravitational acceleration. And t times 2 sine beta, cos beta plus t sine beta equals mg. So t equals mg just over 2 sine beta, cos beta plus sine beta. If you don't mind, take out the common factor sine beta 2 cos beta plus 1 horizontally how many forces do we have okay t cos 2 beta f and t cos beta so f plus t cos 2 beta equals t cos beta and F equals T cos beta minus T cos 2 beta, which will be T cos beta minus bracket 2 cos square beta. I'm using my double angle formula again. 2 cos square beta minus 1. It will be T cos beta minus 2 cos square beta plus 1. I know my t will be this expression. So I'm going to sub it in. mg, let's write it nicely, sine beta 2 cos beta plus 1. And the top part will be cos beta minus 2 cos square beta plus 1. Now, let's think about that one. If I have 2 cos beta plus 1, then I would say minus cos beta plus 1. Cross multiplying gives us, all right, cos beta minus 2 cos square beta plus 1, which is exactly this bit. So, working backwards, mg 2 cos beta plus 1, 1 minus cos beta over sine beta 2 cos beta plus 1 cancel cancel and we ended up with this nice looking expression in terms of m g and beta as expected okay I would say this question is a pain in the ass. Too much calculation. But let's try whether this question is doable or not. I think the first term will be, of, let's say, implicit differentiation with respect to x. 2x cos x squared minus 2y sine y dy dx equals 
3 root 2 on pi times y plus 3 root 2 on pi x times dy dx. Pretty good. Now I'm using x equals square root pi on square root of 6, y equals square root pi on square root 3. I know x square will be just pi on 6, y square will be pi on 3. So 2 times root pi on root 6 cos pi on 6 minus 2 times root pi on root 3 sine pi on 3 times dy dx equals 3 root 2 pi times root pi on root 3 plus 3 root 2 on pi times root pi on root 6 times dy dx. The left hand side will be 2 times root pi on root 6 times root 3 on 2 minus 2 times root pi on root 3 times root 3 on 2 again times dy dx equals let's do some cancellation first these two gives us root pi this one will be 1 root 3 and let's say root 2 cancels with root 6 root 3 remains root 3 cancels with a 3 and this bit will be root pi all right root 3 times root 2 over root pi plus root 3 on root pi times dy dx these two will cancel out and these two will cancel out as well these two cancel out these two cancel out ah let's copy it down to the next line root pi on root 2 minus root pi dy dx equals root 3 times root 2 on root pi plus root 3 on root pi times dy dx hmm getting closer root pi on root 2 minus root 3 times root 2 on root pi equals root pi dy dx because I'm transposing this one to right hand side root 3 on root pi times dy dx the next thing taking the common denominator root 2 times root pi so multiplying these two terms by root pi gives us pi minus multiplying the top and the bottom by root 2 we have 2 root 3 the next thing equals dy dx root pi plus root 3 on root pi which is dy dx dy dx times a fraction it's root pi the top one will be pi plus root 3 now pi minus 2 root 3 over root 2 root pi equals dy dx times root pi pi plus root 3 so dy dx will be pi minus 2 root 3 over root 2 root pi times root pi 
over pi plus root 3. And these two will get away. So it's pi minus 2 root 3 over root 2 pi plus root 3. Let's compare this one with the given form. Very good. So A will be 2 and B will be 3. And we finished. All right. I hope this video will help you in some way and good luck with the exam too on next Monday. See you next time.